<laughs> it looks like the clock says it's nine o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mitchell Love, and I'm extension agent here in the county. And I'm going to share this time, the next few minutes, of visiting with you on this topic of what's in the bag and what's in the bottle. What we're going to be doing is, is looking at what's in those fertilizer and pesticide packages. Okay, that's, that's our main focus here today. And let me say that if you've got a question during the course of this, feel free to ask. I'll sure do my best to answer it for you. Now, we're going to start with pesticides, okay? We'll start with pesticides to begin with. Um, what is a pesticide? Well, an effective pesticide is something that reduces pest populations. It is not at all uncommon, if, if you just listen to people talk, that when they, when they refer to a pesticide, they're talking about something that kills insects. But, but there's all manner of pests. There are plant pests, weeds are pests. Diseases caused by fungi, those are pests. Uh, nematodes are pests. Mites are pests. They're bugs, but they're not insects. So a pesticide is something that will control any one of those things. Insecticide, or pesticides that control insects are insecticides. Pesticides that control plants are herbicides. Pesticides that control fungal diseases or fungicides, and so on and so on. Miticides control mites, and miticides and nematodes control denicides, control rodents, and the list goes on. Okay, now, some pesticides kill the pest outright. Okay, I mean, they, they, they kill the pest, it's right up front. Now, others don't necessarily kill the pest outright. They may interfere with progression from one life stage to the next. And that, in essence, controls the pest population, but doesn't outright kill it. Okay, it cuts its life short. A good example of that would be, uh, you know, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a naturally uh, uh, derived compound that's used to control mosquito populations. It can be applied to standing water. It doesn't kill mosquitoes per se, but what it does it keeps those young mosquito larvae, those wigglers, from ever advancing to the adult stage. So, so it controls the population. Others uh, are growth regulators that may only inhibit the production of eggs. And so that slowly that population of insects dies because it's not reproducing itself anymore. Okay? So those are all different ways that pesticides can work. They don't necessarily all kill the pest outright. Now, a common question that I receive about pesticides is, are pesticides toxic? Okay, well what does the word toxic mean? Anybody ever looked the word up in the dictionary, toxic? There, there are, it's an adjective, and there are a number of definitions that go along with it, but it's not uncommon to see or to read uh, explanations that include the words, causes significant damage. Harm. Okay, so a toxic substance is one that causes significant damage or harm to something. So to answer that question, let's consider let's consider this this plant right here. This goose grass. Okay, it's a nice little grass plant, not hurting anybody. It's just doing what God made it to do. You know, it makes a seed, it grows, it lives a while, makes another seed. That plant dies, and those seeds come up again next year. So it's doing what it's intended to do. Now, depending on what you're doing in the landscape, a lot of folks are going to look at this as a grassy weed because it does not conform to the same uh, appearance qualities as turf grass. It takes up space in a vegetable garden. It takes up space that competes for nutrients and sunlight, etc. in a flower garden. So it's an undesirable plant, but it's just, it's just a grassy weed. Okay? So if we're going to control this thing, you can control it. I'm just going to work on that TV screen. You can control it with a, with a mixture of, of vinegar and salt. Well, dang, that's not toxic. You need that. You do that every time you eat a pickle. Okay? You got a vinegar and salt combination. So that's not toxic, is it? But you killed it over here with Dicol, which is a contact herbicide. Well, which one is toxic? As far as the goose grass is concerned, they're both toxic. Okay, both of them are. All pesticides are toxic to some. If they're not, there's no benefit because the pesticide is designed to control 
a pest. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have some kind of toxicity towards that pest, it's of no benefit. Now, pesticides are tools. Okay, they're 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 designed to kill things. Ultimately, that's what they're designed to do: kill things. They they vary in how they do that. But that's their ultimate goal: kill things. Now, experts believe that they are just like any other tool. They're safe when used correctly. Okay, a hammer is a tool. You don't hear much about the dangers of hammers. But if you are careless, you can match the tool out of your thumb. And, and you can certainly be damaged. You can be hurt by a hammer, just like any other tool. So that's the key, I think. And we're not here to talk about using pesticides. We're talking about labeling what's in the storm. But that's a real key, just using any other tool to use it correctly. Okay, you're going to improve the safety uh, issues of those things tremendously by doing that. Now, every pesticide you buy, so if you, you've got some toxin there, okay? You've got some toxin there. Well, how much toxin is in there, okay? Well, every pesticide, by law, is required to have a signal word on it that gives you an indication of its relative toxicity. And those five uh, or four signal words are listed right here. And, and, and the relative toxicity is measured by something called the LD50. The LD50 stands for the lethal dose. That's what LD stands for. 50 is 50% is, is of the population. So in essence, LD50 stands for the, the, the amount of the material that will be lethal to 50% of the test population. A lot of times it's mice. We're talking about yeah. Animal products, okay, insecticides, etc. It will kill 50% of the test population within 14 days of them being exposed to. That's what LD50 stands for. So, the lower an LD50 number is, the more toxic the material is. And, and that LD50 is expressed in milligrams of pesticide per kilogram of body weight. So the most toxic one out there will have the signal word danger on it. Or it may say poison or danger and poison. And the really, really bad one is going to have skull and crossbones on it. Or the really, really bad one. I mean, that's not a good way to say that. The, the more toxic ones will have a skull and crossbones on it. But the LD50 is anywhere from 0 to 50 milligrams per kilogram body weight. This is referred to as highly toxic. To put it into everyday terms, that's anywhere from a taste to a teaspoon is all that it would take to be lethal to 50% of the test population within 14 days after being exposed to it. The next most toxic one, and we're going in descending order here, the, the, the word is warning. It's got an LD50 of anywhere from 50 to 500 milligrams per kilogram body weight. So it's referred to as moderately toxic. It would take anywhere from a teaspoon to a tablespoon to be lethal. Okay. And, and let me oh, we got time. let me to point out something when it's talking about a teaspoon or a tablespoon, they're talking about the technical material that's used to manufacture the pesticide that you're purchasing. Okay, it's not necessarily that formulation you have, but it was the pure technical material that's used to do that. Okay. Now, the third one, which is for a long time, was the least toxic rating out there, caution. And it has an LD50 or has an LD50 of 500 to 5,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. This is low toxic, or referred to as low toxicity. Anywhere from an ounce to a pint. Okay, it could be lethal. To, and, and we're probably primarily talking about adults here. <laughs> now, a new one has come out in the last few years, and the only caution associated with it is keep out of the reach. Okay, keep out of the reach of children. And you're going to find that almost anything. Okay. Uh, relatively non-toxic, greater, an LD50 of greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram by the way. So anything more than a pint would be viewed as keep out of the reach of. <clears throat> keep in mind, if somebody was to package water and sell it as a pesticide, it would by law have to carry that keep out of the reach uh, symbol on it. Mm -hmm. Because all pesticides have to have a signal word that indicates their relative toxicity. So. The most toxic is up here at the top. 
And if they send you order danger, warning, caution, and keep out of the reach. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what kind of toxicity you're looking at. Now, let's look at a label. This is a common herbicide, Trimet Classic, broadleaf herbicide. It tells you that right on the front. Okay, so right off the bat, what's the signal word on that? Signal word danger. Okay, so this is a fairly toxic herbicide because you got the danger signal word right over here. They're all going to say keep out of reach children. That one also says danger on it. So it's a fairly toxic material. Uh, and it's in a gallon container. Okay, it's sold in a gallon. So let's back it up I and mean, look at this, this label a little bit closer. The label tells you what the active ingredients are that are in that package and, and what the percentage of active ingredients there is in that package. Okay? Now, this has three active ingredients in it. Um, and, and these are the scientific names, okay? Now we can kind of break those into common names. This dimethyl amine salt of 2,4-dichloroethanoxyacetic acid is 2,4-D. All right, that's what's commonly, that's what is commonly known as 2,4-D. This same dimethyl amine salt of blah, 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 tropionic acid, MCPP. All right, a common herbicide. The last one, dimethylamine salt and dicamba, blah, 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 is normally just in everyday language called dicamba. So this has three active ingredients, known as a three way herbicide. It's got 2,4-D, it's got propionic acid, it has dicamba. Well, what's the percent active ingredient in there? The total percentage. It doesn't tell you what the total percentage is, it tells you what the percentage of other ingredients is. So it's 64.38% other stuff. Well that means that it is 35.62% AI, or active ingredient. Okay? So more than half of this is something else, it's other ingredients. Well what are other ingredients? Well, it, it, it depends. It could be a variety of things. Very often it can be a solvent. Okay. Now you keep in mind, if you use the word solvent, you think, well, that's pretty bad stuff. Well, it might be, but also water is a solvent. Okay. Keep that in mind. But it could be a solvent that helps to keep, uh, um, it helps the, the, the material, or it breaks down, this is herbicide, so it may break down the plant covering on the leaf so that the material can enter the leaf and it be absorbed, and then therefore enter the plant and do a better job of killing it. If it were an insecticide, it could be the same kind of thing, like a surfactant, okay, that would allow it to adhere to, or, or, or stick to the tissue, or the, the skin, the exoskeleton, whatever it is, and be absorbed into it. It could be plain water, okay? It could be, if you buy what's known as an RTU, a ready-to-use product, that means it's already mixed, it's in a jug, and you go and you don't you don't do anything else to it, you just apply it straight from the jug. When you buy something like that, you're buying water because it's already been diluted out with water, it's ready to use. This would be referred to as a concentrate because you're going to mix this with water. Okay? And the label's going to tell you how to do that. So you've got 35 odd percent active ingredient, 60, almost 65 percent other stuff in there. Okay. Yeah. We'll back up this second. So, how much is really in there? Okay, let's put this in perspective. Let's put it in perspective. And I'm going to try to write on this. Maybe I can. Or you can read it. I may have to write it and turn around too. Okay. But in a gallon, how many ounces do you have in a gallon? It's got 128 ounces in a gallon. Okay. So, 128 ounces in a gallon, then. In, in this gallon of material over here, so, so if we break that down into terms of ounces, you've got 45.59 ounces of AI. 45.59 ounces of active ingredient, okay? And that means then that you've got uh, A2, uh, A2.41, Ounces of other. All right. 
So well less than half of what's in there is not active ingredient. Okay. So if you read the label, if you read the label, it's going to tell you, and let's say we're, we're going to use this, this is a, a herbicide, it's probably going to be used on turf grass. So if we're going to treat the lawn with this to kill weeds, then we look at our use rate. If it's a tall fescue lawn, we're going to use 1.5 ounces, an ounce and a half of this per thousand square feet. Okay? An ounce and a half of the material per thousand square feet. So if the use rate is 1.5 ounces per thousand, Then, how much stuff, how much active ingredient is there that we're applying to that lawn area? Well, you're going to be applying .53 ounces, just a hair over half an ounce of active ingredient per thousand square feet. Okay, per thousand square feet. Now. I heard somebody one time say, I'll never have it pretty long because I won't put all that stuff on there. Well, that's, that's fine, but I want to just put it in perspective. Okay, put it in perspective. From an ounce standpoint, from an ounce standpoint, that one ounce has got And that's how much active ingredient is in. Okay, just a little over 10 milliliters. Just a little over 10 milliliters. Now, if if we look at how much this stuff costs, okay, look at the cost. So, this gallon, if you went into Hooper Supply in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to buy this, this gallon costs forty-eight dollars, whatever tax is added over. So it's forty-eight dollars a gallon. Then it costs thirty-seven and a half cents per ounce. Okay, a back to green. That's what it costs. Well, not not just back to green, but it's thirty-seven and a half cents per ounce. That's what it costs. So then. If you use this to treat your lawn, it takes an ounce and a half to do that. Then your 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 cost to treat your lawn per thousand square feet for material only is and I'm not gonna write it out here, but fifty-six cents. Okay? It costs you fifty-six cents per ounce or per, per thousand square feet to treat the lawn. So that gives you an idea of what the value of this is. Well look at another example. Another brand, weed out long weed killer, but it says it contains trimic herbicide. And if you, uh, and this is in a pint, a pint container. All right, we look at the label. Well, I'll be gone. We see those same words. It has 2,4-D. It has propionic acid. It has dichemical. But look at the other ingredients. 87.46 percent other ingredients. Well. So what does that mean? If you got 87.46% of other ingredients, how much active ingredient do you have? You have 12 and a half percent active ingredient compared to 35% active ingredient in the other product. Okay. Is, is this better than the other product? Is the other product better than that? No. No. Okay, remember the other product, 35% active ingredient. The use rate on that product on tall fescue was an ounce and a half per thousand square feet. Okay, this is way less than half the percent for the, the strength, okay, the percentage of active ingredient. The use rate on this product is going to be four ounces per thousand square feet. So you're, you're going to be putting out roughly the same amount of active ingredient. You're just buying this in a smaller package. Well, that's convenient. You don't worry about storage. You know, you, it may be enough to treat the lawn one time. I don't know how big it 
but from a cost standpoint. not going to see an expiration date on them and it has to do with how they're stored if you store them in a fairly climate controlled environment so they don't go through numerous thaws and freezings on, on liquid products they'll last a very long time uh, now when it, if for instance they separate and that means that that you may have an emulsion where you've got some solid particles in, in emulsionless and liquid over time, if they go through the freeze and thaw cycles enough, they'll separate, they'll never reconstitute. So, yeah, then they're no good. Okay, they're no good. Uh, if, let's say, if a container does not have a good seal on it, well, over time, some of those aromatic hydrocarbons can escape, just like gasoline, and it becomes stale. So it's not as potent as it once was. So it reduces in, in effectiveness or in efficacy over time. And plus, it may take in moisture if not doesn't have a good seal on it. So that's going to change the constituency of the, of the product. So technically, I've never seen an expiration date, but it all has to do with storage. And on fertilizer, we'll talk about those in a minute. If they're not stored well, they can, they can take in moisture and become like bricks. And I mean, they still got fertilizer in them, but using this tub. Okay, then you've got not tree spikes, you have tree bricks. <laughs> so this stuff costs $9, and, and you know, remember, if this was a what, a 12 and a half percent AI, actually 12.4% AI. AI just adds back to the ingredient. Okay. So it's 80 some odd percent something else. Now, it costs $9.50 per pint. Okay. So if it was a 1,000 square feet. So the cost, the cost to use this, and you're going to put out the same amount of herbicide, it's $2.36 per thousand compared to 56 cents per thousand. So you're putting out the same material, but you're paying a lot more for it. Okay, you're paying a lot more for it. So in this regard, I think it's important or at least that you, that you know what you buy. Okay, no, is one better than the other? No. I firmly believe that most of these companies, and I don't care what it is, not there may be some out there that's different from this, but I think most companies, when they manufacture something, they would like you to buy it more than once. And if, if it works like it's supposed to, if you get the results you wanted, then the chance of you buying it more than once are much greater. So I fully believe that these products will work when used as directed. Now, very often, failure to receive desired results is operator error as much as anything. Because labels aren't good reading. They're not fine literature. They're not interesting to read. They, they're long. And very often, we'll gloss over where it talks about timing of applications of herbicides, okay, or insecticides, and so on. And I'm not talking about, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's not the kind of time. I mean, I'm talking about the stage of the pest. You know, young weeds, active growing weeds are easier to kill than old mature weeds are. When do you notice crabgrass in your lawn? When do you notice it? In the summer, okay? Well, when does it come up? It started coming up in March, okay? It hasn't grown a whole lot yet because we've had kind of a cool spring. My crabgrass at home in the places where I've got it, it's, you know, standing about yay tall. Now, some of it's even younger than that because it's just not very true. Maybe that's some cool texture. But when you really, when it gets real noticeable is up in the summer when it's really big and it's already made a seed head. Well, at that point, you waited too long to get good results from these products that control crabgrass because it tells you on the label, control them in the three to four inch stage or the three to four tiller stage. That's when they start to put out their side sheet. So that has a lot to do with it, okay? But look, look and see what you buy. Is it a good value? And you know, you pay for convenience. If the convenience is, I only want a little bottle of this stuff, I can use it, I'll be done with it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But the, the percent active ingredient so on can have an effect on the economics. All 
I just heard them. Any questions about about the pesticides? All right. Now then, uh, I already said. Let's look at fertilizer just a minute. Let's talk about fertilizer. Uh, what is a fertilizer? Well, I mean, it's something that you apply to a crop to supply it with nutrients with hopefully the idea of making a positive impact on its performance. Trying to supply enough nutrients to help the plant achieve what it can achieve, that it can grow to its full. Now, there are various, just like, and I didn't say this, but there are various forms of, of pesticides, okay? There are also various forms or types of fertilizers. You can have synthetic fertilizer, you can have synthetic pesticides. What does that mean? That it was, <laughs> that it not, was not derived from natural materials, so that makes it uh, synthetic, okay? Organic, then, implies that it was derived from natural materials. But I did have someone say this, and you know what, you think about it, there's a little bit of truth to it. He said everything that is in the world is made from the world. So in that respect, it's all organic. <laughs> well, I don't believe that's gonna fit many definitions of organic, but it is, it is something interesting. So the synthetic materials, you know, they've been, and they're created in labs, there's chemistry involved. Okay, there's chemistry involved with organic fertilizers. You know, we're talking about plant residue, animal waste, that sort of thing. And then there is such a thing as what are known as synthesized organics. They are organic compounds that are synthesized in a way. Well, when most people think of organics, it's probably not what they're thinking about. But urea is a prime example. Today, it's probably the most inexpensive nitrogen source available to us. Urea. Yeah, but it is, it, it's, now, urea occurs naturally. You know, urea occurs in urine, okay, uh, et, et cetera. But urea fertilizer is synthesized. Yeah, methylene urea, urea formaldehyde. Uh, but when people talk about organic, I think they're referring to most people are plant and animal residue. You know I mean? All right. Now, how many different nutrients are essential for plant life? I don't know that everybody agrees on it. For a long time, there were 16 essential nutrients. Well, then it's jumped up to 18 essential nutrients. And I sat in on a talk the other day from a, a professor at Tennessee State that he listed 19 essential nutrients, although that one, I think it was, I think it was fluoride, if it was on this list. It was, only, it was not essential to all plants, it was essential to some plants. So I think that right now the consensus is there are 18 nutrients that are essential to most all plants. And that means essential. They've got to have some of those, some, some quantity of all of those, in order to, to live and do what they need to do. Now, three of these come from non-mineral sources. They come from the air and from, and from water. That's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. The rest of those all come from the mineral portion of the soil. They come from the dirt. Uh, and they're broken into three categories. The primary nutrients, also referred to as macronutrients, are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Are they any more important than the others? No, they're all essential. Okay. What makes them a primary nutrient or a macronutrient is plants use them in a greater quantity than they do the other. They use more nitrogen. Actually, they use more nitrogen followed by potassium is the second most used, followed by phosphorus. Now you have secondary nutrients. Calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are secondary. They're just as important. They're called secondary, though, because they are used in a smaller quantity than the, micro, than the macronutrients, but in a greater quantity than the micronutrients. And micronutrients are used in a very small quantity. And you'll see that list zinc, chlorine, boron, molybdenum, copper, iron, manganese, cobalt, and nickel. We were talking about nickel being essential for plants, you know, cobalt being essential for plants. But it is, yes. Uh, well, uh, if, uh, if, you fact, if you break down the uh, elements that make up us, it's almost uh, exactly the same. Oh, yeah, very similar, exactly. But I mean, we just don't think about things, you yeah. know? We don't think about it. You know, we, we think about plants being green stuff and so on, but how does nickel influence that? You know, it's, I mean, I can't tell you what nickel does. But it's, it's essential. I accept that. I don't question it. I accept it. All right. So, fertilizers, fertilizers are primarily going to be looking at applying the, the mineral portions of the nutrients. Okay, not so much the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, 
but the mineral portion. Now that, that there are some carbon, silver, and yes, they are, they are some. But that's probably what we're looking, like, looking for in fertilizers. Whoops, that's it. Okay, so fertilizer terms. You, you will see the term complete fertilizer. All that means is that it contains all three of the primary nutrients. It contains some quantity of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And it'll always be listed in that order. Nitrogen first, followed by phosphorus, followed by potassium. And it's not truly, it's not pure phosphorus, it's not what you're going to find in the fertilizer, it's phosphate. Okay. And then the potassium is not pure potassium, it's potash. And it has some quantity of potassium in there, just like it said. Uh, phosphate has some quantity of phosphorus in there. Yeah, I mean, if it was like a potassium, it probably would blow up because of, it explodes in midair because of moisture in the air. And, and that's the reason that also that some of these are more readily absorbed moisture and, and make bricks because of the compound there and where the materials are. So, uh, 6 12 12 fertilizer. That's complete. It's got 6% nitrogen, 12% phosphorus, 12% potassium, triple 13, 13% of each of those. An incomplete fertilizer does not contain all three of those primary nutrients. It may contain only two. Okay? An example of that is uh, uh, diammonium phosphate, 18% nitrogen, 46% potash, or uh, uh, phosphate, or phosphorus, we just generally say phosphorus. No potassium. All right? Diammonium phosphate is you, you're probably not going to go out and buy a bag of diammonium phosphate. You could, but you're probably not going to. If you look hard enough, you can find it. But if, you, if you're buying lots of fertilizer, you're buying bulk fertilizer, and you want to have a custom blend, the diammonium phosphate is one of those materials called DAP, it's D-A-P, is used as one of the blending materials to create custom blends. But that's an example of an incomplete. A straight fertilizer is an incomplete fertilizer, but it only contains one nutrient. And generally, generally, most of us think about that one nutrient being nitrogen. Okay, because it's not uncommon to see a 4600. That's what urea is. Now, before, before uh, we, before the terrorist activity increased in the world, the common nitrogen <coughs> fertilizer was ammonium nitrate, 3400. A very good economical source, also a very good oxidizer in a component of some homemade oil. So today, you're probably not going to be able to go out and buy a bag of 3400. But those are straight fertilizers. They just contain one nutrient. They don't have to contain just nitrogen. Here's an example of a 007. All it's got in it, and from, a, from a nutrition standpoint, is a little bit of potash. A little bit of potash. But also, crap, well, let's point, I forget this thing that's going on the TV screen. Crab grass free of Okay? Why in the world would you want crabgrass pre with a little bit of potash in it? Nothing else. Makes a lot of sense, especially on cool season turf grasses. Because crabgrass pre emerges, and again, this is not a use class, okay? Crabgrass pre emerges have to be applied prior to, as do all pre prior to seed germination taking place. So cra crabgrass begins to germinate for us sometime in March, most people do. So you make an initial application. Before seed germinates, so early March, late February, early March time frame. Well, it won't last all season long. Okay, it won't last all season long. This microbial activity in the soil, water, etc., the degrades. It's going to play out after a while. Crabgrass can germinate up until frost. So, if you want to have the best opt opportunity to inhibit grass, those crabgrass populations, then you've got to make a second application sometime. Well, on cool season grasses, that second application probably going to be up in May, early June. Well, we don't, we don't think you ought to fertilize cool season grass like tall fescue and bluegrass on with nitrogen after the middle of April. Well, boom. Here you can apply crabgrass control plus potassium. If you look up what potassium does, it's a hardiness nutrient. And it, the idea is a little potassium can help make that grass stronger, cool season grass stronger to withstand the stress of the summer. So, so that, and that's way more than you probably want to know. But that's another example of a straight fertilizer. It's an incomplete, but it's a straight fertilizer simply because it only has one nutrient in there. Okay. Now, uh, other fertilizer terms, there's the, you'll hear the term blended fertilizer. And that's probably the most economical fertilizer you can buy. All that is is a simple physical mixture of dry materials. Each nutrient 
that is contained in that package has its own particle. All right. If you ever bought a bag of fertilizer and you had brown particles, you had kind of gray particles, you may have had some dill or some orange particles in there. Each one of those was sunk. Okay, each one was sunk. Uh, because, because this is just a simple physical mixture, if the sources, let's say if the nitrogen source has a particle of one size and the potassium source has a particle of a smaller size, then in the process of applying those, because of different weights, they settle out. And you can have less than 100% uniform distribution because heavier particles, even if they don't settle out, heavier particles have a tendency to be thrown further if you use a broadcast spreader, the lighter particles won't go as far, so you have uneven distribution. So, I mean, that is a consideration, okay? Now, higher quality blended fertilizers are going to use compounds or, or materials that are roughly the same weight, same size. Another way to mitigate that is spread half your fertilizer going one direction and spread the other half going another direction, so you kind of offset that. So you don't have to spend the extra money to get the very similar benefits. Now, something that does away with that issue entirely is using a homogenous fertilizer. That is a fertilizer with every particle, every pellet, a preel, however it's formed, has each one of the nutrients included in it. If it's, a, if it's a complete fertilizer, that means every one of those got some N, P, and some K in it. <coughs> it doesn't have nitrogen particles, it doesn't have phosphorus particles, it doesn't have potassium, they're all included in one. Uh, those tend to be more expensive. Okay. Uh, anybody priced any fertilizer this spring, look at it. Uh, if, you go to the home, if you go to the home improvement store, the garden center, think about all the main, main, what If you think of a brand of fertilizer, what's the first brand that comes to mind? Well, that would be what I thought of. Okay. For, for your law, which would be the first one you think of. Scott. Scott, it's exactly right. Scott's made the advertising more than anybody. You know, Scott from Scott's Cross, you feed it, Mom. You know? Okay, they advertise more than anybody. Well, check their prices. Compare, compare Scott's price to, say, Vigoro or to Stagery or somebody. The Scott's is always going to be higher. The Scott's is a modern as far Every particle is as close to the same as you're going to get. Okay. In the in now in the in the fertilizer world, you'll hear the term greens grade. Okay, greens grade fertilizer are those that are of high quality, good particle size that you would apply to a golf green. Okay, because that's the most intensely managed grass in the world. A golf green. So, uh, okay, one more, two more. Fertilizer grade or analysis, that's the percent of the, the, the NP and the K that's in there. All right. So you'll, you'll, a lot of times you'll hear, not a lot of times, but occasionally you hear folks refer to ag grade fertilizers. Triple 13 is an ag grade fertilizer. Triple 15 is an ag grade fertilizer. Triple 19 is an ag grade fertilizer. Okay. Why? Because that, those have been used in agriculture for years and years and years. And then fertilizer ratio is in a ratio of the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. 6 12, 12 fertilizer, common garden fertilizers, good starter fertilizer for gardens. And this would be viewed as a starter fertilizer, lower nitrogen, higher phosphorus, higher potassium. It, so the ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is a 1 2 2. Okay. So you got twice as much P and twice as much K as you do nitrogen. All right, fertilizer terms. So let's look at a bag of fertilizer. Now, you remember, complete fertilizer has all three major nutrients. It probably got some other things in it too. The major nutrients, the NP and the K, they'll be listed in a big number somewhere prominently on the back. The remaining nutrients will be listed in smaller, in smaller wording elsewhere on the back. This super rainbow, okay, 50 pound bag of super rainbow, triple 13. Look at the little closer. There it is, triple 13, guaranteed analysis. So we know it's got 13% nitrogen, 13% level phosphate, 13% potash, but it also has, it's got magnesium, 9%. 9% sulfur, 0.10% boron, 0.10% iron, 0.40% manganese, 0.2% uh, zinc, and no more than 9% <coughs> chlorine. And then, you, I mean, it's not all in there, but what materials these were derived from? Ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, ammonium phosphate, buried potash, sulfate, potash, Met, uh, magnesium, sodium, calcium, boron, etc. Borate, etc. 
Those are the things that went together to make that fertilizer blend. So, in that 50 pound bag, how much nutrition do you have? All right, so here's, here's how much is in there. Well, if we worked in, in, in 100 pounds, it's simple. You got 13 pounds of NP and K, each of those, but this is 50 pounds, so it's half of that. So we got six and a half pounds of N, six and a half pounds of P, six and a half pounds of K. We've also got a pound of magnesium, We've got four and a half pounds of sulfur. We've got 0 0.05 pounds of boron. 0 0.05 pounds of iron. 0.2 pounds of manganese. Tenth of a pound of zinc. Four and a half pounds of chlorine. For a total of 29.9 pounds out of our 50 pound bag. That's how much nutrient is in there. So what is the rest of the stuff? Well, in this case, most of it is carrier, all right? It's carrier. It is because there was nothing that was used in the, in the formulation of this that was 100% any of those nutrients, only percentages, okay? So if this mineral out here, you know, this uh, uh, ammonium nitrate, okay, it's only 34% nitrate. So that means then it's what, there's uh, uh, 70, uh, Eight, uh, uh, 67 or uh, 66 percent of that is something besides nitrogen. Okay, so every one of those components that's used to make this up was not 100 percent of any of those. So it would be very, I have never seen a fertilizer that was 100 percent. Okay, it's never going to be that. Now, you can certainly get higher than this. Okay, you can get higher, but um, it'll never be 100 percent. Now, there are. Um, um, sometimes there, uh, there's filler in there, and the filler is there to help you get good distribution. All right, and that filler might be, uh, it might be corn cob, ground up corn cob. It might be uh, silica or just sand. Okay, in some form in there, but it's a way to help you spread this stuff uniformly because if you got just a small quantity. You want to spread it over a thousand feet. It's tough to spread, you know, a half a pound or something over a thousand feet. It's much easier to spread four pounds over a thousand feet because you got more material to work with. So that's that's why it's that. So in that bag, you know, you've got 30 pounds of, of nutrition and, and 20 pounds of something else, basically what amounts to it. It's never 100%. All right, now, and, and I, did, I did check the price on this, and I bought some this spring. That trip 13 runs about $28 a bag. I made it a little bit cheaper, 520 runs about 20. So it's going to be in the 19 to 25 dollar range, right there. Okay. So you get 30 pounds of nutrition. Now, Miracle Grow, the one everybody thought of as the first fertilizer of the stock. Well, it, it, why not? I mean, it's sure out there. There's nothing wrong. That's in a pound package. Okay. That's in a pound package. All first plant food. Feed every 7 to 14 days. These instantly. What does that tell you? See the watering can there? This is a highly water soluble fertilizer. It's designed, this one is designed to be mixed with water and applied around and to the plant. Now, let me say this about foliar feeding of plants. Plants are not huge foliar feeders. They do take some in through plant, through, through foliage, but they're going to take the most of their nutrition out of the ground through the roots. Okay? So, it, it's more important if you're going to use this, if, you, if you're in a hurry, you just need to pour something around the plant. Pour it around the plant. Don't worry about trying to soak the leaves good, okay? Because you're going to get more feeding from the roots of the earth through the leaves. It will take up some of the leaves. But, so, again, this is complete fertilizer. It's got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as it's got some boron, some copper, some iron, some magnesium, some aluminum, and some zinc in it. Okay, I mean, it's pretty high nitrogen. The other was just was 13%. This is 24%. Okay. How much, how, tell me how much does a pound of Miracle Grow all purpose plant food cost today. I don't know. That involved. Eight or nine, ten dollars. Eight dollars a pound. Okay. And, and the other back there, it, it most, it, that, that triple 13 would be $28. That's the most. It, it's not going to cost that much, but that's, and I failed to check the price on it, but that's the most it's going to cost. Okay. Well, so in that pound, I mean, here's what you got. You got 3.84 ounces of nitrogen, 1.28 ounces of, of phosphorus, and 2.56 ounces of potassium for 24.816 ounces. 
24, 8, 16, or 8. And you're paying nine dollars a pound or whatever it costs. So there, from a from a, a, an economic standpoint, the nutrition in this other bag over here is more economical. Now, is it any better? No, no, it's not any better. Um, and in some cases, it's not as good depending on the purpose, on the use. If you're going to fertilize a lawn, well, this is terrible. You know, this is terrible. The other stuff's pretty good. Or if you're going to fertilize a great big garden when you plant, triple thirteen's pretty good. If you're going to if you're going to fertilize pots, this stuff is great. Okay, if you're going to fertilize small containers, this stuff is great. Uh, it, again, it just depends on what you want to do and the convenience factor. Okay, the convenience factor. Will you see a faster response from this than you would from, say, a granular fertilizer? Probably so. Probably so. Because a granular for any nutrient, okay, has to be in solution for the roots to pick it up and use it. So it's got to be in solution in water for it to be used. And something, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, uh, it does not matter what the source of the fertilizer element is. Is it an organic source or a synthetic source? But the plant, the nutrient has to be converted to the mineral non-organic form in order for the plant to use it. So that, that's why organic fertilizers are the original slow-release products. They have to be broken down by soil microbes into their inorganic form in order for plants to use it. So it's virtually impossible to burn a plant by over applying fertilizer, organic fertilizer. Now you can apply enough to cover it up, okay, that would be an issue, I guess. But that's when organics are the natural, the, the absolute, always 100% slow release because they will not release fast. They have to be broken down by nature in order for them to work. Okay. Any questions about it? And look at this. You know, you use a tablespoon for a gallon of water. Well, how much is in that gallon? Not much. Not much nutrient. You use a gallon for 10 square feet. So you're not putting a lot of nutrition out there, but you're applying it every seven days, every seven to 14 days, what's like the uh, So that's, and that's the reason that, uh, uh, that's the reason it has to be applied so often, because there's not a lot there. You're spoon feeding, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not the most economical way to feed it, but in a lot of cases, it's the most convenient way to feed it. And it's, it makes more sense to do it that way. So any questions about, uh, about fertilizers? Okay, yes? Um, if you were to say, like, have like a couple of earthworms that would like make their own fertilizer, uh, what would be the MPK on that? I don't know. It depends on what they ate. I mean, it's just like it's just like livestock here. His question was, you know, what would be the, the NP and K content of worm castings? Um, I, you know, I don't know. Just like uh, for for cattle, what's the NP and K? Well, it has a lot to do with half what they ate. Okay, diet influences that. Now there are tables out there that uh, uh, university folks have put together over time of research, and steer manure from Midwestern feedlot. They'll have you know the the book value. For, from the nutrients found in that. Well, it's different from dairy manure because they're fed differently and the water content is different. Also, a dried material versus the wet material. So it's hard to say. But there's no question it's going to have all three of those things in there in small quantities. Yes. I almost think it would be higher in those uh, minerals since that soil is what that worms digest. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, 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 and when, they, when they calculate the fertilizer content, they're calculating the minerals. But yeah, it would be, and it would be. Uh, uh, it would, but well, you know what though? It's still, it's still a. If you think about it, everything we're, we're, we we are all vegetarians. If you think about it, because even if we eat meat, the majority of that ain't grass, and so their you know their nutrition, their their com their composition. Uh, from the nutritional standpoint, came from those grass plants, whether it was corn grass, wheat grass, grass grass, etc. But the manure aspect of it is still that organic, and that's what worm castings are. Basically, the manure is still got to be worked on by those soil microbes that we have laid. Yeah. <coughs> but there's going to be some in there, you know, just like every plant. Every plant, if there's 18 essential nutrients, if that's a healthy plant, it's going to have a little bit of all those in there. That's why, you know, compost is good stuff. Not necessarily from a high nutrition standpoint, you know, but but it does have some nutrition in it. Okay, every bit of plant has got some nutrition in it. Not a great amount, but some. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could 